Everyone was the murderer. My grandmother was the detective by popular vote. We murdered each other and died laughing. Dad would grope Mum in the bedroom. Arnold would walk around with his arms stuck out like a monster. And Clive would strangle all of us in turn. Every Christmas Day evening, I hid in the corner of the spare room. I never wanted the game to end because no one could stop laughing. And it was hysterical and terrifying. And I'd have a coughing fit. And Mum would say, careful, Ben, you'll do yourself a mischief. But I went on laughing and coughing. And the girls screamed. And then we, were, we went downstairs and Gran set us off again. She sat there in her pink coat, peeling satsumas, and said, Well, Clive, I think it was you. Or, John, you look guilty, are you? <laughs> Golf has nothing to recommend it at all. I want someone to go round whipping the gloves out of their back pockets. I can't fucking stand those gloves. So that when they reach for them, oh, they're not there. Replace the caddies with complete strangers. I don't know, dinner ladies. People who don't care and can't afford to care. And we could pull the plug on all that money while we're at it. Then we'd see how much they love the game, wouldn't we? <laughs> Get rid of the man from Motorola with the huge cheque and leave the trophy. The winner gets the trinket and nothing else. Here's your trophy. No money, no expenses, nothing. Goodbye. <laughs> The balm of consolation is just too strong for some. Its most powerful ingredient is not the emollient lie that time heals, but the more astringent perception that whether we heal or not, the wound was deep and real and ours. I opened it and I had this sudden rush of fondness for her. I thought, allow it! It is pink! <laughs> Don't know. Seriously, it was the colour of my bedroom at home. Yeah! No, my other home. <laughs> you put that thing straight in my head! I'm not joking! You put that thing straight in my head! You are dangerous, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You have to look behind the contents of houses, behind the furniture and the soft furnishings, the lights and linen cupboards, the radiators that do or don't work, the rotten floorboards showing in the upstairs toilet with the water coming in around the skylight, the colonically twisted plumbing. You have to see <laughs> through the books and shelves, the boxes of discarded toys, the rocking horse in the corner, the Altrincham FC travel blankets and the durry rugs, the tiny working grate in the attic, the Ketterkovitz Museum Berlin poster, the unglued Formica kitchen and study full of leverage files, and drifts of late or never to be filed tax returns, the dark hallway, and the unlikely box room choked with bulk bought sink and drain unblocker. You must penetrate all of this drift and dreck to get to the soul of the building, to what it is thinking and saying in many voices, the voices of everyone who has ever lived or died or stayed there, all of whom go on talking, 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 talking after they've moved on with a sort of calm but intangible insistence, like the sound of a radio being reasonable in an empty room. The lads are wearing suits which draw attention to the spots around their lips. And the girls are still experimenting with makeup, putting it on too thick. And there are some trim mums and one thin, very inebriated grandmother dressed too youthfully, sweeping and swaying to doctor pressure. White ties with big knots go with black shirts, the lads have decided. And some tentative carpet booty is the necessary preliminary to joining the two or three brave girls already on the postage stamp sized dance floor from which the defiant grandmother has just retired in a fit of weeping expectoration. 
one bloke fancies himself as a dancer, but at this stage in the evening restricts himself to a few pelvic rotations while talking at the bar to a girl in a tight, crushed blue bodice perched awkwardly on a stool. She is telling him about a dream involving a vampire, a woman with an eating disorder who looks like Linda, she points at the granny, and an angry face at the window. She thinks the dream is about balance. And just as she says the word balance, the bloke listening to her does a little spin and has to reach out for the bar when he comes back round and covers the house <laughs> by saying, go on, I'm listening, vampires. <laughs> to which the girl responds by taking a sip of her wine and looking down at her shoes. I don't know anyone. I'm in Watton, staying with a friend who's a medical courier and a part-time DJ. He knows the DJ at this party, which is why we're here. Lats start to dance towards the end of a song, I've noticed, rather than near the beginning. This way, they don't have to dance for long and can duck out quickly if they haven't made or feel they're unlikely to make the right impression. <laughs> Certain songs and singers get blokes going, Justin Timberlake, for instance, because he's bringing sexy back, but not to Norfolk, so no competition. <laughs> <laughs> For similar reasons, a good gay dancer is an excellent investment. He can be guaranteed to get people to focus their attention on the dance floor. No one wants to be like him, he's too good, too gay, but while he holds everyone's attention, the more self-conscious majority of the blokes can join him and the girls in the safe knowledge that their own moves will be less obvious, less open to scrutiny, and therefore more alluring. <laughs> the semi-professional gay dance teacher is an encouraging distraction, in other words. And when he's done his 40 minutes, he can fuck off, can't he? And hang around the sports centre corridor while his medical courier friend buys everyone drinks. <laughs> and it's while he's out there thinking, what the... that he's joined by the bloke from the bar who isn't gay and isn't coming on to him, but is lost. They, the we, have a very ordinary, quite friendly conversation about nothing. Gary's birthday, how I know where's, where I learned to dance. And it's while we're doing this that I realise I've gone and put him out of a job. He was going to be the one to get everyone dancing. <laughs> And he wouldn't have been quite as gaily good as me, and now he's missed out. The others have piled on in, and no one cares about the moves anymore. On an impulse, I say, that girl you were talking to, she was nice. And he mumbles, mumbles something, I don't know what. His face clouds over. Then he regains his confidence, and he tells me that he's just started at Travis Perkins down the road. He works in the tool hire office. She, the girl, is four years older, and she's got her eyes on the boss all right, fair play to her. What boss? I say, and push him back through the doors. And he's bright pink, but smiling. So Dr. Pressure comes on again, and the lad meets her eyes, and cocks his head at the dance floor, and she makes her excuses to the fat dad all over her, and goes to meet the unpredictable new recruit from tool hire. <laughs> <laughs> on a just big enough square of light. Mm -hmm.